Become a sustaining member of the Commonwealth Club for just $10 a month. Let me welcome you all again to the Commonwealth Club of California. On behalf of the Asia Pacific Affairs member-led forum, I'm here to introduce and enjoy a fireside chat between two experts on philanthropy in the Asia Pacific. Uh, without further ado, let me introduce our event and our esteemed guests for the evening. So um, now Forbes magazine reports more billionaires in China than any other country in the world. Uh, many of them, in addition to grassroots donors as well, are interested in making a positive difference in their own countries, the Asia Pacific region, and elsewhere in the world. Many of them partner with and benefit from the Center for Asian Philanthropy and Society, or CAPS, um, which is headquartered in Hong Kong and helmed by Dr. Ruth A. Shapiro. The center conducts policy research, applied research, commissioned research, and convening. In collaboration with its extensive network of local partners and support from Asian philanthropists across 18 Asian economies, CAPS generates evidence-based insights into, into how individuals, companies, and governments can best address social challenges. CCS fundraising has relationships with nonprofit clients, leaders, and donors throughout the Asia Pacific, and all of um, these parties benefit from the work of the Center for Asian Philanthropy. So um, for a bit of a more formal introduction, Dr. Ruth Shapiro is the co-founder and chief executive of the Center for Asian Philanthropy and Society. Um, as Gloria mentioned, it's based in Hong Kong um, and works throughout Asia. So CAPS is really committed to producing world-class evidence-based research to help philanthropists, governments, and social delivery organizations maximize the positive impact of private social investment. Dr. Shapiro is the primary author of Pragmatic Philanthropy, Asian Charity Explained. Um, and she's also the editor of The Real Problem Solvers, a book about social entrepreneurship in America. She also co-authored Building Energy Efficiency, Why Green Buildings Are Key to Asia's Future. Um, she founded the Asia Business Council and served as its executive director since its incep um, inception in 1997 until May 2007. Um, she has a doctorate from Stanford University and master's degrees from Harvard University and George Washington University. Um, and of course, she has a long and deep history with the Commonwealth Club. Welcome, Ruth. Um, joining Dr. Shapiro is Rui Liu, Senior Vice President of CCS Fundraising, an international strategic fundraising consulting and management firm with 18 offices across the US and abroad. Rui was raised and educated in mainland China, Japan, and the United States. She began her career as a development professional at the Juilliard School in New York City and subsequently joined CCS in 2013 as part of the Ansei Fundraising Council team in support of the Global Campaign for the Schwarzman Scholars Program in Tsinghua University in Beijing. Rui is the co-lead of the Asia Pacific Steering Committee at CCS, which advises a number of Asia Pacific and AAPI organizations, including China Institute in New York City and Chinese Hospital right here in San Francisco. She is the author of the 2023 U.S. Philanthropic Landscape Report, the flagship annual report published by CCS, which will be available later this year. Rui was also a Fulbright Scholar with a focus on social enterprise management and leadership while living in Beijing, Shanghai, and Hong Kong. She holds a bachelor's from UC Berkeley and a master's from Harvard University. We are happy to welcome both to our stage this evening. And to kick things off, I'll turn it over to Dr. Shapiro to share her perspective on the most recent trends in Asian philanthropy today. Thank you, Alice. Um, welcome, everyone. This is a little bit hard because I have to do a sweep across the, uh, the audience, which I'll, I will endeavor to do. Um, so I want to just mention a few things about Asian philanthropy, just to kind of get your mind thinking, because what happens is we use these words like philanthropy and foundation and impact, and we think that they mean the same things, but they don't. Um, and we also think that, we, uh, that what is working in the United States is what's working in Asia and it isn't. So I just want to mention a few um, characteristics, but let me set the context first. 
Asia is thriving, and um, we know that some people use the term the 21st century is the Asian century. There's a lot of evidence for that. As Alice said, there's more billionaires in China than ever before um, and anywhere else. Um, there's a lot of money being made in the region, but aside from Korea, Japan, Singapore, and Taiwan, all the rest of Asia are low and med medium income countries, which means they're emerging markets, um, which means that they have a whole set of different issues than those of the United States or Europe. Also, 85% of all firms in Asia, from small businesses to large conglomerates, are family owned. And that has profound implications for how Asian philanthropy works that I'm going to talk about a little bit more. Um, so what that means is when you think about the United States, the big players in philanthropy here, you think about Packard and Hewlett and Ford and Rockefeller and Gates Foundations, none of those exist in Asia. You, you, there are no large private foundations like those. So how does, it, how does it work exactly? Well, these family-owned businesses route the money through the company, mostly. Now, sure, there are some families that may have uh, a foundation and they have their personal philanthropy, but they're also running their company. So they think about how to make the world a better place, how to make communities a better place through the lens of doing business at the same time. That also has fairly profound um, implications for how they think about their social investments. They tend to want to look for win-win strategies, strategies that help the community, strategies that help their company, strategies that help the nation. One of the big differences, I would say, between Asian philanthropy and that in the United States is when you hear, if you listen to NPR, you listen to the Mark Carther Foundation or Skoll, they say, we're here to solve the world's biggest problems. Or you hear a, foundation, a, a head of a, a, a philanthropy say, I'm solving for climate change, or I'm solving for the lack of vaccines in the world. Huge problems that people very regularly hear from philanthropists in this country. In Asia, you're much more likely to hear, this is the community I want to help. And this community may have multiple needs, and I will do what it takes to help this community. So. In Asia, it's more natural to put the community and the people in the center versus the problem in the center. So actually, that can be a big plus. That is, we talk a lot about social justice. If you put people in the middle of what you're trying to do, social justice comes about somewhat naturally. There are three roles of philanthropy, wherever you are. One is philanthropy pilots innovation, and it is the risk capital to try something new, to try a, a new idea. Philanthropy can take risks. The second goal of philanthropy is to do what's known as the last mile. Governments can't do a lot, and so philanthropy often comes in and does the, the harder to reach places, the ones that people can't, the government can't take care of. And then the third, which happens very regularly in Asia, is to support government programs. Now, actually, in Asia, it is very common to work with government, which is quite different. So in this country, regardless of where you are on the political spectrum, we don't automatically default to government is the solution to my problem, even if you're a die-in-the-wall liberal Democrat like me. Um, so we tend to think we are the solutions to our problem. We, and when something happens that we don't like, what do we do? We start nonprofits, we, be, we make philanthropic donations. In America, just thinking that the government is gonna come in and solve the problem is just not part of the mindset of this country. That is not true in Asia, where people do look to the government, and the government thinks of itself as the primary problem solver. So working with government is very critical for organizations right from the beginning. Why do, or why do philanthropists want to work with government? Well, first of all, as I told you, these are business people too. So they don't want 
to work in conflict with government. They want to work aligned with government, this government which can help them do their business. So they tend to look for those strategies and those problems that the government has also identified. And that is true in a place like China, which is of course an authoritarian regime, but also in the Philippines, in India. People want to work alongside government. And that is a really positive thing because when you work alongside government, the solution can be scaled in such a profound way. And there's example after example, which we can talk about, of government then picking up the solution and rolling it out across the country. In fact, I'll give you one example right now in just a minute, Rui, I'm almost done. Um, there's a, a billionaire philanthropist in Korea and I was talking to him and he said, you know, I had this foundation and I was the first one in Korea to give merit-based scholarships. Um, I mean, needs-based scholarships. The government was only giving merit-based scholarships, but many of the people who earned those scholarships had money. So they didn't really need the scholarship. So this fellow um, told me, the government, I decided to do needs-based, and now the government of Korea, all their scholarships are needs-based. They've, they've copied my idea. And I said, well, that is incredible success. Hmm. You've rolled it out. Your idea has been picked up by the government, and now the entire program across Korea is needs-based. And he said, yeah, but now what is my foundation going to do? <laughs> 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 Which is a nice problem to have, really. Um, so um, I think that uh, there is this kind of um, tendency to just think differently about what you're doing. I just want to say that since government is the go-to in mo most of Asia, in fact, probably all of it, there's a rise of public-private partnerships for social good. That is pr the private sector, companies and philanthropies partnering with government to solve problems, and we will see a rise in that. So I just wanna point out some very different ways of thinking about philanthropy from what's happening in this country to kick off our discussion. And now, Rui, I'm, I'm done with the intro. <laughs> that was great. Um, so in many ways, preserving social standing is what drives um, Asian donors when they want to give in the U.S. At the same time, for those of us who work on the ground and really deal with donors face-to-face um, -face or work with leadership in nonprofit in the States, we realize that Asian or not, this idea of preserving social standing is the same thing. Um, so this is all to say that there are many differences and similarities. Um, at the same time, I think it is really about embracing the differences and finding, identifying shared value. Um, something to really highlight is um, the tax incentives. And Ruth, I'm gonna pass it over to you soon. Just for some context, um, you know, a lot of the nonprofit leaders that I work with, they will come and ask, so if a Japanese donors, they don't get tax incentives here, why would they want to give? And that's an assumption. I always remind them that's an assumption. And the reason is because tax incentives are not always expected. It's not a priority for many of the Asian donors. DAF, Donor Advised Funds, for example, here. In the U.S., is very robust. There are about 1.3 million accounts in the U.S. alone. An average DAF account holds about 180,000 U.S. dollars. And in the last two through three years, um, DAFs has contributed over 43 billion U.S. dollars. Um, and if you look at the context of all, U.S. holds about 484.85 billion in contribution. That's from individuals, funding very different from what Ruth had mentioned earlier, and corporations. And if you also look at the breakdown of that, I believe 66% were from individuals, 19% from foundations, 9% from bequest, and 4% is from um, corporations. Now in Asia and in China in particular, it's the opposite. Corporations and other countries um, tend to really take over. Um, but if you look at the makeup of the US contribution, individuals, bequests, and foundations, the decision makers are all people. 
So in other words, 95% of all contribution, 484 billion, are decided by individuals. And that to me is a huge distinction between what Ruth has described in Asia versus what's happening here. Are you saying that you don't think individuals make decisions in Asia? Because I, I wouldn't, do. I wouldn't do. agree with that. Right, right. What, what are you saying, really? Because yeah, yeah. So yeah. I think in a lot of ways, when it comes to Guanxi, Guanxi is about individuals, right, coming together and and sort of build upon that. Corporations, the ones that we've worked with uh, in Asia, um, are very much decided by individuals for sure. The CEOs makes the top decision, everything follows. It's quite transactional when it comes to working with corporations in Asia in our experience. Um, and you're right, Ruth, absolutely. Individual decisions in Asia is the primary focus of what drives uh, philanthropy in Asia. Asia. I do want to quickly um, sort of get your thoughts on DAF, donor advised funds, because when we prepped, I do recall that there was a lot of um, differences when it comes to why people give to DAFs in Asia. Well, I'm happy to answer that, but let me go back and say a few things. So you have to think that you've got a rich family and they own a company and it's usually helmed by a man. Um, as, as unfortunate as that is. Um, and that man has, looks across his, his universe, he has, he can see his personal philanthropy and that of his family. He can see the CSR, the Corporate Social Responsibility Funding, from his company. He can see the R&D, research and development of his company, and the business development of his company. And what happens in Asia very much is those get merged so that you're developing somewhat of a holistic solution that pulls from a number of these different pots of money um, that do create win-wins for the community and for the company. Let me give you an example. Um, China. Baofeng Energy um, is a energy company. And they built this huge solar panel, solar farm in Ningxia province, which is a very dry province. And they found out that under these solar panels, condensation formed, and they were able to go grow crops in a very arid area. And the crops that grew really well were goji berries. And goji berries, I think we all know, in California are superfoods <laughs> and very healthy. So Baofeng used its CSR money, as well as some of the personal philanthropy of the owner, to plant goji berries underneath and train the local people to take care of these plants at the same time that they were taking care of the solar panels. And because it's China, and things don't happen in a small way there. 80,000 people work at this solar farm, and their income has tripled as a result of the goji berries. Um, so that is a great example of win, win, win. But they also did it at a time where the Chinese government was carrying out its poverty alleviation campaign. So not only did they generate renewable energy, solar energy, help these 80,000 people have better income? They got great kudos from the government who was intent on alleviating absolute poverty in, in China. So they created Guanxi all around in many places. And Guanxi is interesting because um, it goes in both ways. You want to do something to accrue greater enhance and your relationships. But those relationships also help you carry out a project. And I'll give you an example. We have a good friend here in the audience from the Philippines. And there is a foundation that he's been very close with named Zulig Foundation. And the Zulig Foundation, Zulig Pharma is a pharmaceutical distribution company, huge global company. And what do they do? They realized that they needed local medical people to really understand what drugs to use and to 
diagnose and prescribe those drugs. So they started training mayors of, in, of towns throughout the Philippines so that they would become the champions of better public health systems, better medical care, and that would eventually help the company. But they also did it because um, they saw that mayors were very integral to getting the job done in the field. So they created Guanxi for themselves with the mayor, but if something went wrong with the project or they wanted help with the project, they know who to call. So they use those relationships to help them be more effective. So it goes in both ways. And so that those relationships help you succeed in a variety of ways. So it's different, right? It's a comprehensive strategy. On taxes, um, I'm, I didn't forget. Um, so Singapore has the highest tax subsidy in the world. And for every dollar that, any, that an individual or a corporation gives in Singapore, you get two and a half dollars deducted from your taxable income. So they have a 250% subsidy. Now, Singapore has a really low tax rate. It's only about 15%. So what difference does it make? If you, and if you ask a philanthropist, is tax incentives the reason you give? I will guarantee you that 99.9% .9 of the time they'll say, oh no, I'm doing this from my heart. Taxes have nothing to do with it. But what do taxes do? First of all, of course, most business people do take taxes, it takes the, take the benefit when they can. Not just business people, all of us. It's real money that you can get, that you can, that can help. But in Asia, it's really about government signaling. When Singapore puts into effect a 250% tax subsidy, what they're saying is, we want you to do this. We want you to engage in this way. And so here, we're putting our money where our mouth is. India is another side of this. India only has a 50% tax subsidy, and it's capped at 10% of your income. So what is India saying? We want you to be generous, but only this much, only this much. But during COVID, Prime Minister Narendra Modi created some, an, a, a fund called PM Cares, Prime Minister Cares, and for that, which is a completely opaque fund that's supposed to be helping communities suffering during COVID, you get 100% tax rebate. So the message there is very clear. We want you to be generous, but we really want you to give money to PM Cares because for that, you'll get a much different. Um, so do people do it for the tax subsidies? No, they do it because they're looking at the government signaling, reading what that means and responding accordingly. On to DAFs. Sure. <laughs> Donor advised funds. I, 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 would, I would almost want to say how many in this room have one, but I won't embarrass anyone, but it is a very common vehicle in this, in this country. They are not used in the same way in Asia. They are just beginning. But again, here, it's mostly used for tax reasons. In Asia, it's used, why? Because it's a lot easier to create a DAF than a foundation, and in most places aside from Singapore, there really aren't community foundations like there are in the United States. So to create a DAF is like a middle ground. You don't have to go so far as to create a foundation. You can have a structure, you can get help, you can get advice by the organization that is providing the DAF. That's one big reason. A second big reason is people think that the United States is the cutting edge when it comes to philanthropy. And it has been for many decades and even maybe century. So when things come from America, it's considered automatically best in class. DAFs are prolif proliferating in the United States. So people say, so banks in, in Asia are saying, oh, you know, we have them too. We're, we must be providing this to our customers because we're cutting edge. That's why UBS just created DAFs throughout Asia. That's why um, the ICBC, um, International, what is it? China, Co Commercial Bank of China. Thank you, George. Um, 
just created DAFs so that they could say to their customers, we are at the cutting edge, we have DAFs, even though they're not used really for tax purposes in the same way. Thank you for that. Um, you know, there are different vehicles in Asia. When we work with Asian donors, uh, family offices somehow are always in conversation. Um, one of the things that really stood out to us is this notion of multi-generational uh, wealth. Um, it's estimated in the U.S. that, you know, over, let's see, 59 trillion will be passed on to the younger generation by 2061. That is significant. And if you look at the overall composition of uh, wealthy donors around the world, majority of them are self-made. So what does that look like? In um, North America, it's about 75% of the top donors are self-made. In Asia, it's about 74%. And in Europe, it's about 66%. So what we are facing right now is a tremendous amount of wealth that's coming to the younger generation. With that in mind, um, Ruth, perhaps you can share a little bit about what the landscape looks like around family offices in Asia, the use of it, how that's different from the ones in the U.S., as well as, I would say, what does the younger generation care about next in Asia? Well, let me just ask the audience, how many of you have heard the term family office? There's no legal definition for a family office. Um, it's generally thought to be the um, prof bringing professional talent to manage your own private wealth um, versus just going to your banker or, or going to somebody to get advice. So you bring it in and you have the advice in-house in this office. Um, Singapore has done a great job of bringing family offices to Singapore. So good, in fact, that they, they used to have the minimum requirement that you had to park 50 million US dollars in Singapore. And there's been so many people who have gone there, mostly from mainland China, that they've just upped it to 200 million in order to go to Singapore. And then you get, when you do that, you get permanent residency, you get your kids into school in Singapore, um, which is a good thing. And your money, it might be, is considered safe there. Um, so Hong Kong has also been trying to get family offices. But the term, since it doesn't actually legally exist, what Hong Kong's been much more flexible, mostly because they've had to be much more flexible. Um, and they're saying, just put some money here and hire some people here. In fact, there is a competition around the world for family offices, and I was shocked. Um, this is a, the Middle East is not really m my bailiwick or that of CAPS, but um, I was surprised the other day. I was listening to CNN, and there was a commercial for Dubai, which is also a wealth center in the world, and they were listing out on the commercial on CNN the benefits of setting up a family office in Dubai, and one of the benefits they listed was customized regulations. <laughs> and I thought, wow, that's really calling a spade a spade. I, I mean, maybe we know that's true anyway, but to put it on a commercial on CNN was really quite surprising. Um, Hong Kong hasn't gone that far, at least at, in terms of the commercials on CNN that I've seen. Um, so um, there is a competition now in the world to bring wealth into that place. Um, it's really not about philanthropy, but because um, family offices are looking at all the investments across a, a, a family might have, that also includes their social investments. So it includes their philanthropy, their impact investing, other ways in which they may use their resources to do good. And so, What's becoming more and more true is the professionalization of philanthropy. But let me just point out one big difference with Asia. Um, as I said, most of the people are business people. That's their day job. And they are working in a community that they know about, that they are embedded in, that they care about, and that they um, have their business operations. So these people feel that they understand the community and the terrain 
where they're doing their for-profit work and their philanthropic work. So what's true in Asia is that the the, 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 the principal, the family, tends to be very highly involved with the philanthropy because they know that they understand better. Um, they don't need, they are not writing a check to go to another part of the world where they don't understand. They're working in their communities. One of the big differences in Asia is that there is this real focus on local. Why? Because you care about that place, because your business is there, because you're trying to cultivate relationships you care about. But also in the eight, uh, in eight of the 18 economies in which we work, there are actually laws prohibiting the money from going out or the, and the money from coming in. So even if you want to give cross-border, it's very difficult because there are laws against it. And that is really to, because the government can control more what's happening inside, if, if, if the money is staying inside their country. Um, so to the next generation, I think it's kind of a meme, and we were discussing this, that, that everyone says younger people care about impact more. That's one of the memes. And I was saying to Alice, are they hiring the Center for Effective Philanthropy? Because that organization does project evaluation of what is, what, what's the impact of a project, and they are not. So the notion of impact, I think, is the next generation is bringing on action. Uh, it's becoming part of the cultural kind of social discourse that they engage in. Their friends are involved with philanthropy. They go out and visit projects. It becomes part of who they are and what their friends are talking about. So in that sense, they're much more engaged. Um, the other point about the next gen is um, they, they, they're looking ahead and they're realizing how badly my generation and the one before it has, has, has messed up the planet. Um, so the you know younger generation cares about the environment, but here again, let me point out a difference between Asia and the United States. The overwhelming majority of philanthropy, environmental philanthropy in the United States, goes to policy. So it's people, it's org, it goes to nonprofits who, like the World Resources Institute, like World Wildlife Fund, like um, the Nature Conservancy huge environmental groups that yes, do programs, but also go to COP 26, 27, soon to be 28, and try to lobby governments for policies around conservation, around decarbonization, around climate change. In Asia, there is no overt lobbying going on, and philanthropists and business leaders tend not to want to fund advocacy organizations. So they don't fund those kinds of efforts that then try to convince government to do something different. Now, they may, if they're wealthy enough, sit next to somebody at dinner and say, you know, I wish you were doing something more on you know, water or I wish you would be really supporting more solar. That kind of soft sell lobbying happens all the time. But the kind of philanthropy that works here in environment is very different. So what we see in Asia is much more conservation projects, saving the mangroves, saving the coral, saving the um, elephants in Thailand, things that are very tangible. And when it comes to climate change, what is the number one project in Asia that's categorized, categorized under climate change? That would be tree planting because trees sequester carbon out of the air. And they are, in fact, dealing with climate change, but they are also very tangible. And that's another difference with Asia, is that people like projects that they can see. And when it's planting trees, it's very visible. But it makes a difference. It's helpful. Um, you touched upon cross-border philanthropy a little bit. And my understanding is that in the audience, we may have a few questions around it when it's Q&A. Um, I just want to comment a few things about cross-border philanthropy. Um, at CCS, we get this question almost every week. How do we get money out of our donors in Asia? China, 
perhaps some in Japan, that's much better there, um, and Singapore. So, you know, what we've noticed is that um, while there are donors who have the intention to give to um, their causes here in the U.S., they're not able to get the money out. My understanding, and Ruth, correct me if I'm wrong, is that Singapore is doing something very interesting right now. Singapore has attracted between 700 and 1,200 of these family offices. That means people putting in between 50 million to 200 million dollars. Singapore is a city state. How many of you have been to Singapore? Oh, a lot. Well, you know, it's, what is the population? Seven million. Um, So it cannot absorb that much philanthropy. There's just not enough need. It's also a fairly wealthy city state. So they have had to, what they're doing is saying, we, we in Singapore don't need the money that much, but we're in a rough neighborhood. We're surrounded by Indonesia, Malaysia, the Philippines, Thailand, and also places like Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia. So they have changed their rules recently to allow money to go out. Hong Kong has always allowed philanthropy to go out, but in Singapore it was taxed before. Now they're allowing these family offices to send money out because they cannot absorb it all. Um, So they are very much endeavoring to become a philanthropic hub for the region. Hong Kong is trying to, but Singapore has got a, a leg up on Hong Kong. And I don't know if any of you know this, but there's a very historical rivalry now, but historically, between Singapore and Hong Kong. Although the government officials in both places now, if you listen to them, they'll all say, of course there's no rivalry, we're completely compatible. But there has been a rivalry and there still is. Um, also to add to that, um, you know, based on some of the experiences in the U.S. dealing with Asian donors, um, there is this sense of we don't have the money here in the States and therefore we cannot give at the amount that you're asking us. Um, in conversation with our client partners, our nonprofit partners, um, you know, one of the things I often say is, when did they come to the U.S.? Because, for example, in China, 2016 is when a lot of things became restrictive, um, especially about outbound investments. However, between 2000 to 2014, there were many, many investors that came in from China. In fact, Chinese named foundation in the U.S. increased 418% between 2000 to 2014. In the U.S., foundation increased about uh, 140%. So just to keep that in mind, half of those 50%, half of those top Chinese named foundations are based in California. The funds are here. Another thing that, um, and Ruth, you know, this is amazing um, to learn recently that ICBC has really opened up their policies. We have donors from China that have able to really get more than $50,000 a year, which is the current restriction limit out of the country um, um, for their needs here in the States. So those are the two comments that I had in my head. But why would a Chinese, you have to think, why would a family in China want to send money, philanthropic capital to the United States? It mostly goes to universities. And it goes to universities to create that Quan Chi that we were talking about. So it is about face. It's also about their own kids, right? Um, as much as uh, universities can say, no, 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 donations don't matter in our admission criteria, um, I think we can take that with a grain of salt. Um, certainly not with our alma maters, but everybody else. <laughs> Actually, Harvard has something called the Z-List, so it's, it's pretty known um, about the, 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 the impact of, of fundraising on, on admissions. So um, we... It's interesting because um, right now there's a kind of a real nationalist pride in China. And I remember um, just last year saying to a mainland colleague, well, you know, Hong Kong people are finding it more difficult to send money into China um, where they have always wanted to because that's that that was their roots. That was their home base. That's where their grandparent, their 
parents and their grandparents came from. And, 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 and this fellow said, China doesn't need any philanthropy from Hong Kong. So um, there was this sense of, we don't need your help. Um, but I think that the flip side also is many of those donors who have given to universities here, um, from China, but not only, from India as well, have gotten lambasted by um, people on the internet in those, co in those countries who have said, why are you giving money to Harvard and Cornell and Stanford when we have so much need here at home? So the internet has, along with government policy, has kind of tamped down on um, people wanting to give money outside. Um, there's a negative ramification, especially if you want to continue to do business. There's a very famous um, philanthropist in India named Ratan Tata, and the Tata Group is the most storied um, conglomerate with 90 different product line, uh, companies associated with it. Um, and he was a v graduate of Cornell, and he, and he spent time at Harvard, and he gave money to both. And actually, the government in India sued him um, because they said, you shouldn't send money out. And that it, uh, because of who he is, it was in every paper, and there was a lot of public opinion. Generally, the Tata name is is golden, and it's it's so well respected in India. But with those contributions to Harvard and Cornell, his reputation took a little bit of a hit, um, prompted on by the government who didn't want to see the money going out from India. Yeah, it's very unfortunate, and we've seen that in different parts of Asia. China and even Japan. Um, I would love to, I want to be mindful of the time, um, but we still have two questions that we want to make sure to cover today. Um, one is more a philosophical question for you, Ruth. You know, we talked about the role of government, how they're important in Asia. If the government is able to provide services, what is the role of philanthropy in Asia? Yeah. Well, um, Japan is an interesting example because Japan has essentially cradle to grave care. Um, the, the government really does provide full education, full health services, increasingly services to the elderly because it's one of the countries that's getting old quickly. Um, and so what, is, what do philanthropists do? There's this plethora of private museums and symphonies. <laughs> Um, because that became like the thing to do. Ha and they're very small museums <laughs> and very small orchestras. So um, I, don't, I don't know that that's particularly efficient, but I think that wealthy people started kind of saying, well, that's what I do. Do you do? Oh, yeah, I do that too, you know? And, and so we have these little museums, these little private museums all over the place. Some of them are public, um, like the Mori Museum or Suntory, but a lot of them are private. The role of philanthropy, as I said, it's not, it's, it, it's risk capital to be more innovative. So you have to think that a lot of these people are in fact running businesses, as I mentioned. They br bring that business acumen into their minds and say, you know, I might have a better solution here. Um, and let me give you an example of that as well. Um, in Malaysia, the, um, the sovereign wealth fund there, Kazana, um, realized that, and it's a realization that's being done all throughout Asia, because we know Asia has been relying on rote learning for most of its education, uh, you know, kind of curriculum and pedagogy. So Kazana realized we're not developing thinkers, and we really need problem solvers, we need thinkers. And we sponsor that kind of training and that kind of creativity and that kind of innovative thinking in our company. And so Kazana developed, really spearheaded by an amazing woman, Shanaz Akhtar, who was the chief financial officer of Kazana, um, said to the government, look, we, we think we can roll out some of the programs that we use in our company and create student-centric learning that really fosters creativity, problem-solving, innovation. Um, can we do it in some schools? And this, the, 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 the Malaysian government said, yes, you can. Um, we'll let you do it in 20 schools. 
And what happened? Scores went up. Student happiness went up. Student confidence went up. All these measures about the, the, the effectiveness of this program. So then they went back and they said, well, okay, can we roll it out some more? And the Malaysian government said, okay, we'll give you a whole province to roll it out. And that's what's happened now. And the, the, the goal is to have the Malaysian government change the way school happens, the way education happens throughout the country, and they're well on their way to it. So it was using the business acumen, the thinking, the rigor, the tools, and rolling it out across public education to, to a very effective extent. So I think that that idea of piloting innovation is really key. The second is um, the, 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 the governments have goals, but as I said, many of these are emerging markets. They cannot do it all. So philanthropy does what that last mile, that those hard to reach places. And a lot of times, philanthropists are not that original. So what gets short shrifted that philanthropy can really, or the government can't do it all? So in many economies, and, I, and, and it's, it's true here in this one, healthcare tends to be focused on when, after people get sick. It's not enough focused on preventative care. And governments focus on when people, after people get sick. Philanthropy can play a role in preventive health care, in screening and diagnostic tools. Um, so they can complement what the government is doing in a really important way. Um, and I'll give you another example of that. Novo Nordisk, which is a, um, uh, a diabetes diagnostic company that makes dialysis museum, um, machines, um, what it does with its CSR in Asia, I, I assume they're doing this elsewhere in the world, I don't know, um, and I know they do it in Asia, they offer diabetes testing. Now that's really helpful. If you, if you find diabetes early enough, you can treat it so much better. Now that's good for Novo Nordisk because they're a diabetes um, you know, intervention company, but it's also good for people. So prevention is really an area in healthcare where philanthropy can play a role. Um, and then lastly, just to supplement government, to say here's your goal, like in the case of India with PM Cares. Here, here, Mr. Prime Minister, I trust you. You're doing great work. Here's more money to do it. So that happens too. <laughs> Um, you talked about innovation and the link to philanthropy. Um, one of the common questions that we get a lot um, is, what is the state of AI and philanthropy? Um, you know, with um, everything that's been happening, uh, chat, GBT, everything that's been implemented in the nonprofit sector in the U.S., at least at CCS, we're seeing that innovation is a key. We actually hired um, data scientists with PhDs to really get into the details of it, of what it'll look like. In Asia, what does that look like right now? Well, tech is becoming, of, of course, a lot bigger. And crowdfunding is a phenomenon. So crowdfunding is kind of the GoFundMe type of um, mechanism. In China, Tencent has a 99-day, and they raise a um, billion dollars in one day normally through this um, crowdfunding vehicle. I just want to point out that crowdfunding is a mixed blessing. It, it is a retail way of getting everybody involved in philanthropy. The downside is that most people then fund what I would call heartstrings kind of um, projects. Somebody's child is sick, somebody's house got blown away, and people want to help. And so they get online and they do that. Crowdfunding does not lend itself to systematic change, which is what's really needed. So crowdfunding is a blessing, it gets more people involved, that's terrific, but it also um, doesn't, it's, it's more about Band-Aid solutions than, than solving the original problem. With AI, interestingly, um, one of our colleagues just recently asked ChatGPT, what are the best, the top best foundation, uh, nonprofit organizations in India? The top 10 best. 
and what they got was the most famous. So chat GPT doesn't really know about efficacy. It looks across everything that's out there and these names came up again and again and again. Whether those most famous ones are the best, that that's not clear, right? We can't assume just because it's well known that it is the best. So now when, when organizations ask our organization for advice, I say, you better have a really great re website. Um, because this kind of AI, they're looking for what you're putting out there. They're gonna, they're gonna make decisions based on that. So I think it's gonna change the terrain of who gets funded and who doesn't. That is very important for our marketing colleagues. Yeah. Very good to know. Uh, we cover a lot of topics. Um, before I hand it over to Alice, um, just a quick uh, recap. You know, we went over overview of Asia. We talked about DAF. We talked about multi generational wealth and what that looks like in terms of office, off, uh, family offices. And then we talked about looking ahead, including AI and the importance of updating everybody's website. Um, it's a lot of topics, and I understand that we do have a few questions. So I'm going to pass it over to you, Alice. Thank you. This is a great conversation. Many actually of the topics that have come up are the same ones in these questions. So I'll pick ones that haven't yet been covered. Um, this question is for Ruth. So when you, uh, this question is around philanthropists in Asia saying um, that they want their communities to prosper. Um, the question is about what is their vision? How do they um, envision their communities or social structures to change? I think that, um Asia is still very much a patriarchal place. Um, it can be somewhat of a matriarchal place, but it's the idea that you have, it's noblesse oblige, you have a responsibility for the people in your community. That is still very normal. So, um, and, and it goes in both directions. So wealthy people in a community feel that they have a responsibility of taking care of the others, and the others, think that they should be taken care of by the wealthy people. So um, here in the United States, people would say, well, who are you to tell me what to do or try to help me in this way? In Asia, it's welcomed. So I think that um, this notion that I want to help my community, as we, either where I'm from or where my business is, is very much a part of kind of the mindset and the culture of the place. Thank you. Um, the next question we have, um, which you both touched on a little bit already, is about intergenerational transfer of wealth. So um, this question is about any, if you can share any trends or changes that you're seeing uh, within individual or corporate philanthropy given the transfer of intergenerational wealth. Well, I think that this transfer of wealth is happening at a time where there's something else going on, which is there used to be very clear demarcations between the private sector, the government, and in this country we call it civil society, but that's a loaded term within the Asian context, so we call it the social sector. Um, and everybody had their jobs to do. Now in the world, companies are being asked to step up in a way that they never had to before, whether it's, it's, it's often through ESG, but it's also this notion of, what are you doing with shared value? What are you doing to help your community? And so companies have to care about these issues. So at a time when the next gen is essentially coming into the leadership of these firms, the pressure on these firms to step up and solve community problems has never been greater. So I think that whether they like it or not, they have to embrace their role as a problem solver and not just a money maker. So I don't think that anyone subscribes anymore to Milton Friedman's kind of value for shareholder mentality. It's all stakeholder all the time and you have to think about your stakeholders. And so the, this next gen, they, they, that's part of what they're growing up into. And so these formally pretty strong demarcations, they don't exist anymore. I can agree with you more. And I realize that maybe I should give the mic to um, uh, uh, Ruth as well. Is that right, Dan? Can everybody hear Ruth okay? 
Okay. I usually don't have that problem. <laughs> <laughs> um, to your point um, earlier, I would also add that we're seeing a lot of younger generations with wealth um, really paying attention to DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion, that corporations are now being held accountable. And the t- CEOs, the top donors that we deal with when it comes to corporation, need to be um, need to realize that even more, uh, in my view, how important that is to the younger generation. They're also a lot more hands-on. It's not just about monetary value, um, as Ruth said. It's really about being part of it, being part of the solution, and seeing it through. Um, so a lot of the cultivation strategies that we think about in the US will need to shift a little as well. I think DEI, I just wanna say, I was in Taiwan a couple weeks ago, and um, I was there's a there's a magazine there called Commonwealth Magazine, which is their Business Week, and um, they said we're going to give an award on DEI. I said what DEI? There's no black and brown people. Like what do you, what what is what is the DEI in Taiwan? And she said, well, it's about the elderly. Like we are another one of those places where we're getting really old and we're not having any babies. So our inclusion has to be. Bring, keeping elderly involved in the companies, in the community. So I think that it's another example, DEI, where we assume we're talking about the same thing, but we may not be talking about the same thing. So um, I, I did create an or, another organization called the Asia Business Council, and they we were discuss, I was discussing with them recently about having a program on this, and the question is, who do you want to include? Because we can't assume that we're automatically talking about the same. So yes, philanthropists and business leaders are do need to include more people. They need to include more women. They need to include more minorities. But it may not be exactly the same as what we're talking about here. Yes, thank you so much. So we have a two-part question um, for you, Ruth. Um, the, these have been already so enlightening, but can you give an example of um, one, DIY, do-it-yourself philanthropy by an Asian company, and then second, a company improving their relationship with government through their philanthropy? Yeah. DIY is a term that I used in my book, Pragmatic Philanthropy, because um, we see more and more companies doing it on their own. And it actually has pretty profound ramifications because if you, you might, the company might say, um, why should we give money to a nonprofit organization? We have people out in the field. We understand the problem. We have a distribution system. So why go through a, an intermediary organization? And we are seeing that more and more. It, it is profound because that's the civil society piece. Those are the nonprofits that are that third leg of the stool when we think about society in in a Western context, it's it's shrinking because many companies are doing a lot, but they may not be doing it with and through a nonprofit organization. So how they evolve, they they're helping their communities. They're just not necessarily um, uh, um, in, engaging. So let me think of an example. Um, before. Um, things went back went b- backwards in Myanmar. Um, one of the the b- the biggest company there, the biggest legitimate company there, I should say, um, not associated with the generals, um, r- knew that seventy percent of Myanmar, and this is before the current disastrous situation, knew that seventy percent of Myanmar still is without electricity. Um, so what did they do? They decided to go into villages and basically put set up LED lights around a, a football-sized pitch at night. And so um, they did that, and everybody went out into that area at night. The kids could do their homework. The you know, you could play mahjong or whatever you were playing. You could talk to each other. You could conduct business because all of a sudden there was an area in each village that had light. This company was particularly strategic because what they did was they went to their own employees and they 
let those employees pick their home village. So the employee became like big man or big woman on campus by bringing light to their village. This really only cost about 3,000 US dollars per village. So they got a lot of bang for their buck, um, but they did not work through any organization. They did it themselves. Um, so that's DIY philanthropy. It also got them points with the government at that time, the, 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 when the government was still somewhat functioning. But um, the biggest example of um, being able to, well, certainly if you give money to PM Cares in India, you're, you're getting, and Narendra Modi will be happy. Um, and I think a lot of companies in India want to make him happy. Um, but one of the biggest examples is the five-year poverty alleviation campaign in China, where China said, we want to alleviate absolute poverty, just full stop. And they did, which um, as, as, as much as we hear negative things about China in this country, to actually alleviate absolute poverty is a feat that has not been accomplished in human history in any other place, and they did it. And one of the ways that they did it is that they said to the state-owned enterprises and the private companies, you need to be part of this. For the state-owned enterprises, here is your assigned locality that you need to help. But the private companies stepped up, and I'll give you an example. Alibaba created a $1 billion a year fund called the Poverty Alleviation Fund. The money came from the private wealth of the 30 founders of Alibaba, who all had become extremely wealthy, came from Alibaba CSR. It came from the company's R&D and business development, and they also got government funding. And what did they do? They went into poor areas and they helped small businesses and farmers improve their goods and their products such that they could then be put on the Taobao site, which is like the eBay site associated with um, Alibaba. So Alibaba gets many more products onto their, onto their site, um, and these small businesses can thrive and sell more products, and they were able to m put a billion dollars a year toward that. And did I would say the government appreciated them up until the time that Jack Ma criticized the government, and then <laughs> things changed. But um, in the moment, that was part of what their their strategy was. Great, thank you, Ruth. Well, this has been lovely. I'm noticing we have just a couple minutes left, so I wanna give each of you the chance to um, share any closing remarks you have before we end our program tonight. Well, many of you in the audience know me, and I really appreciate that you've come. And for those that don't me know me, I also appreciate that you've come. Um, I think that one of the things that is true about humanity that makes me feel more optimistic and positive is I do think we, we wanna help each other. It's part of the human condition. We, we want, when people are in need, we wanna help them. And I think that that's a really beautiful part of who we are. And so philanthropy and charity, these are just means by which we come together and solve problems collectively. And so we have a lot of problems, but this natural human tendency that we have, this is what's gonna save us, I hope. And so um, I hope all of you are engaged in making the world a better place. I think you are, or you wouldn't be here at the Commonwealth Club and just carry on. Very much on the same note uh, with Ruth. Um, so my firm CCS is 76 years old and we do feasibility studies. And these are interviews with many, many donors across the US and also abroad. Um, the top reason on why people give, it is because people give to people. And to your point, Ruth, um, and, and you know, I've been with the firm for over 10 years now, but, but I really realize the genuineness when people tell you that in their face. 
once you get to know a person, regardless of their background, lived experiences, when they're really talking about things that they care about, they're very genuine. And that's what drives philanthropy, in my view. And that's what drives um, what we're doing worthwhile. And I do think that the more informed we are, the more we're able to embrace differences and not to criticize that. So with that, Alice. Yeah, well, thank you. Please, everyone join me in thanking Dr. Shapiro and Rui for this conversation. Thank you. Thank you all as well for your questions. Um, you all are welcome to linger um, outside these doors for wine following the event. But with that, uh, this meeting of the Commonwealth Club of California in its 121st year of enlightened discussion is adjourned. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.